Professor Cook here. This week we'll be starting our unit on gender, gender identity, sex, and we'll eventually get into sexual orientation. Um, but for today we're going to start getting into some concepts that are going to help us to put um, the reading that we're doing in, of Janet Mock's autobiography into context. Uh, the autobiography, Redefining Realness, uh, is I saved for last because it's really interesting and it helps to have all the content we've had up until now before we read this this text. I do want to move on into talking about gender so that we're prepared for the reading responses and the next quizzes. That said, I still would like to have a discussion about Indigenous American women and the issues of identity that were brought up in that in the later chapters of that book because I think that the idea of identity construction, both from an internal to the individual and societal or external to the individual perspective, are, are themes that connect both of these texts, Indigenous American Women and Redefining Realness, in ways that highlight a lot of the key concepts that we've been talking about. So we will we will be getting into all of that. This is uh, This content in this particular set of slides is fairly advanced. Um, some of these concepts are not discussed until upper level courses or even graduate school level courses. So if it's a little confusing, please uh, reach out and ask questions. I will try to make this as clear as possible and we'll be um, breaking this down into probably at least two or three mini, mini lessons here for this set of slides. Before I get into talking about gender and um, identity and social constructions of masculinity and femininity, I wanted to just um, touch on this, this um, issue and the Transgender Day of Remembrance. The last time I presented these slides, we actually had an event on campus about the Transgender Day of Remembrance, and it was on this day of November 20th. But I wanted to point out that, um, unfortunately, as everything else in our society, as we've been learning about other identities, um, the intersections of those identities you have can create even more oppression. So not, not all transgender people experience the same amount of oppression. I mean, it's a very marginalized group, don't get me wrong, that's, I'm not... Um, suggesting that it's not by any means. Um, I'm saying that if your family is um, middle class and educated and has access to um, access to health care that covers some of your gender confirming uh, medicine and, and treatments and surgeries, that's a completely different experience than someone like um, Janet Mock in her autobiography in the earlier part. So she talks about you know, being from a relatively um, poor family and not having access to those and having to really, and this was a different time too in the U.S., um, having to really learn to self-advocate and, um, and find resources in her community. Um, not that her family wasn't loving, just that they were in a different position uh, socially. So the Transgender Day of Remembrance is to remember um, transgender and non-conforming people who have died violently in the U.S. Frequently this is um, people who have been marginalized and are, are sex workers, not always, but um, are working in the sex industry and they are often murdered and unfortunately, disproportionately, this is um, trans women of color who end up dying violently. So last year when I pulled these statistics, it was 22 transgender and gender non-conforming people in the U.S. And if you remember um, that we had a couple of mass shootings last fall in uh, Dayton, Ohio and in El Paso. And in the Dayton, Ohio case, one of these 22 people was um, the brother of the shooter who was killed in Dayton um, and was misgendered. In the, in the news media coverage. Uh, so that is just, just a connection there between those, between those horrific events. Um, worldwide, uh, stats were at 331 um, transgender or gender nonconforming people who died violently, and I would guess that that number is slightly higher. But this is tracked annually, and Transgender Day of Remembrance was started 
last year I believe was the 20th anniversary and it was started by someone who had lost a loved one who was transgender to violence. 1.4 million Americans identify as transgender, which is a transgender person, which is only 0.6 of the population. So it's a small number of people, but as you may know, this is a growing identity category as people start to um, come out as transgender more frequently. Um, and unfortunately, however, we as this is happening, as, as a culture, we, we're becoming more aware of gender identity as separate from sexual orientation, as separate from other identities, uh, we see increasing hate crimes against transgender and gender non-conforming people. Um, so that's just some context. Um, the opposite of transgender is cisgender, C-I-S, cisgender. So people who are born with a certain set of genitalia and chromosomes, assumingly, and are um, assigned a gender identity, and then they internalize and also identify as that gender identity, those people are cisgender uh, people. So most, most of us are cisgender people. We were born with certain um, biological traits. We were assigned a sex category. We were assigned a gender. We continue to identify with that gender. Um, people who have a difference there, who identify differently than their um, assigned sex and assigned gender at birth, might identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. Okay, so we'll get more into that, but I just wanted to um, briefly touch on that before I got into this construction of masculinity. Um, if we were in class, I would start with this activity, which I think is a really interesting way to explore some of the assumptions embedded in masculinity. Um, so you can kind of read through these questions and we would we would talk about this as a group and I would give you time with a partner to talk about it. Come back to this in one second. But I wanted to just say that often when we start to talk about gender, that gets translated as talking about women's issues or women's oppression or sex discrimination, harassment and violence against women which we do definitely need to consider that stratification based on gender in the United States and worldwide. But what I think we talk about less often, at least at the um, undergraduate level and just in everyday interaction, is the social construction of masculinity and femininity itself in the United States and in Western cultures um, more broadly. So part of the back the background of this activity is to get us to consider, to think about, to not take for granted these categories of masculine and feminine, and instead to problematize them, to use a kind of fancy word, but to say, look, why, why do we consider this to be feminine or masculine? Is that a construction or is that an inherent behavior that's linked to our um, biology? <laughs> Long story made quicker here, most sociologists are going to say that your gender identity is a combination of um, maybe 80% social construction and just a little bit of biology. So for, for us as so social scientists, we generally would consider your masculinity, your femininity to be socially constructed um, through interaction. So here's an example of that. In this image, you've got a picture. This is, by the way, this is from a J. Crew catalog. I think it's J. Crew. So they're actually trying to sell the striped sweatshirt, or he's got a striped shirt on in the picture, but they're selling clothing. Um, but this is showing a little boy and his mom, and she is painting his toenails, and she's painting them pink. And so there was a lot of criticism about this image in a catalog. Um, as you can imagine, this was criticized because nail painting is not a typically male or boy activity. Um, plenty of people I know who are men get their nails painted and get manicures, etc. But this is not typically constructed as a male activity. So the fact that they're doing that was considered um, violating a gender norm and also the color of the nail polish being, being pink 
uh, a color that is constructed as feminine um, is, is considered a violation of gender norms. So I'll let you kind of think about that, but the point I wanted to make was I want you to consider what are the assumptions about masculinity here? Why, why are people upset about this? What inherently is wrong with a boy painting his toenails pink? Why would that be upsetting? Um, and when we're in class, we kind of talk through that. And, and if you are offended by this, that's, that's, you know, fine. That's your opinion. And I'm not suggesting you have a different reaction. I want to point out that this is a construction. My guess is that if the mom here was with her daughter and they were painting toenails pink, this would not be an issue. We would not be talking about this many years later. Um, also, if this were a father and a son doing something that we might consider stereotypically masculine, like playing catch instead of toenail painting, that would also not be an issue. Um, so I want to kind of consider that. And I think we could even have a, a father and a daughter playing catch, right? And that wouldn't be considered as much of a gender norm violation uh, as this picture. And I think what would make this more upsetting to people is if it were a dad painting the son's um, toenails. Because dads are supposed to, moms and dads are supposed to be the agents of socialization and gender. So when they break those, not only when their kids break those norms, but when they are participants in breaking those norms, um, others can sanction them or punish them socially quite harshly. So here are some here are some uh, reactions to this that I think get at the point I'm trying to make. So I called this policing the gender police because I guess I thought I was being kind of clever when I um, <laughs> made this slide title. But what, what I want to say about this is not whether you agree or disagree with this on a conservative or liberal um, you know, political check-in. What I want to point out is this idea of policing gender. Policing gender here is enforcing normative gender expectations on a person um, if they're not acting in accordance with what you expect of them. So people critiquing right, this boy and the mom also for painting the toenails pink, they are policing that child's gender performance. They are sanctioning, um, usually with, with negative sanctions here, um, that and saying, we, this is not typical behavior. You need to, to get this um, back in line with what we would expect of someone of this identity. So all of that is to say, we, we do this all the time. Um, we may not even be conscious of it. And I, I was kind of trying to point out earlier that I think for girls in the US, we allow more stereotypically boy or male behavior. And we don't allow boys to do more stereotypically girl or feminine behavior in the same way. That is called the asymmetry of gender change. The asymmetry of gender change Basically, that is saying that for girls, gender roles have broadened, have opened up more for girls and women in the last 40 to 50 years than for boys and men. So one example of this is when you come to campus, hopefully that will be happening again in the fall, you'll see um, both men and women wearing jeans or pants or shirts and people dressing in ways that in the past would have been considered uh, extremely androgynous or gender bending. Um, but you do not see, or me, I, I myself tend to like menswear a little bit. So sometimes I like to dress a little more uh, masculine with a button up shirt, a blazer. Occasionally I've even worn a tie um, just to kind of make a point or to be funny. Um, but, and, and I get some, I get some looks for that. That's, I'm not saying I don't have some reactions that I notice when I've done that. But I can do that and feel fairly comfortable, whereas my husband has never, to my knowledge, gone to work in a dress or a skirt. He does have a kilt. I'm not going to lie. He does have a kilt for hiking. Um, <laughs> but 
he's never gone to work in a dress, right? Whereas I can go to work in a dress, I can go to work in my, well, my pajamas right now, not wearing pajamas today, just saying, um, or I can go to work in menswear. So that's, that's kind of the point here. People generally don't negatively sanction me, but I'm guessing if my husband went to work in a dress, uh, he would face a lot more notice, a lot more um, overt reactions and negative sanctions. And people would make assumptions about his sexual orientation that may or may not be accurate. So the other point I want to make here with this activity is that gender is not the same thing as gender identity, is not the same thing as sexual orientation or attraction. So someone can paint their fingernails pink and still identify as, as straight, okay, if they're someone who's male. Um, and that's, that's kind of implicit. I think so, what's behind some of the fear about behavior like this is that this um, young man will be somehow, as they say here, confused uh, and act like girls or end up um, identifying as gay or bisexual. And w I'm, not, I'm not saying those things are negative. I'm saying that's the fear behind these um, reactions. And implicit in that fear-based reaction is a devaluing, I think, of the feminine and a devaluing of people who are not straight. So I think you kind of get at some of those implicit assumptions there. Whereas a girl acting like a boy is considered less threatening. Well, if, if masculinity is valued more than femininity, why wouldn't girls want to act like boys and be tough, right? Um, but if femininity is valued less than masculinity, well, then we're going to see the sanctions more harshly against um, the, the boys acting in a feminine way. All right, that was a lot. Hopefully that made sense. So just a, a little refresher on some of these terms here, and then I will, I will stop for now. Um, when sociologists talk about sex, Right in this in this um, context, we are not referring to intercourse or the act of of sex. We're talking about biological characteristics you are born with. So this is usually um, genitalia and chromosomes. Uh, most of us um, ha are are categorized into one of two sex categories at birth, but there are individuals who are intersex who have traits of both sex categories. And that is what the I and LGBTQIA um, usually stands for, okay? On the other hand, so sex you're born with, okay? And you're assigned in how we interpret those um, traits. Gender, on the other hand, is socially constructed. So gender is both something that exists at the level of society and it's in an internal identity. All right, so it's a socially constructed, learned set of attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, um, values that characterize people of one sex or the other, but it is not inherent. So when people, when um, babies are born, they're often dressed a specific way so that people react to them to enforce these gender standards, these gender um, role standards, okay? Think about what toys are marketed toward um, girls and boys. There's nothing inherent in girls wanting to play with um, more beauty-based toys or dolls or caregiving toys. Those are socially constructed and marketed to them because we expect people of that sex and gender category to grow up and perform those, those kind of stereotypically feminine roles of caregiving and um, beauty for performance, if you will. All right, so gender roles then, so sex, biological characteristics, gender, learned set of attitudes, behaviors. So sociologists are more concerned with the gender and the gender roles aspects here. Gender roles are the behaviors that we expect, okay? So you might, um, whether, whether or not, sometimes we do a little game about this in class, and you may, may remember this from other classes I've taught. So I want you to think about whether or not if you know what um, mascara is, okay? I want you to think about if you know what mascara is. No Googling yet. 
Um, and if you know what that is, uh, my guess is you likely identify as um, a woman. Uh, and even if you don't wear mascara, you probably know where it goes uh, in terms of its makeup, where it goes on your face. But a lot of times when I've asked this question in class, even if the students that I'm reading as women don't wear mascara, they know where it goes. Whereas the students I read as men or who identify as men often don't know, um, don't know, they know it's makeup, but they often don't know what part of the face it goes on. Okay, so the reason for that is because we are taught from a young age um, what we are supposed to know. That's like a gendered construction of knowledge there. And I'm sure there's like a masculine equivalent um, for boys, you're supposed to know how to throw a football, right, or something like that. Um, okay, so we learn gender roles through agents of socialization, um, through our parents, through our peers, through media. So we are going to get into um, the media and constructing masculinity, and you've got, this is a picture of Jean-Claude Van Damme from an actor from the 90s, 80s, 90s, uh, still acting, I think, a martial artist. And this was in a, a martial arts competition movie. I don't know how else to describe that. Um, okay, so we will talk about this a little more in the next part. Thanks.